So here's the thing, I'm a big fan of The Boys. I've mentioned it once or twice in videos, but yeah, I love this show like a lot of people. I think pretty much everybody would agree that The Boys is easily the best superhero show on television, although Loki season 2 is making a very strong case for itself right now. It has an insanely compelling story, fantastic characters that all represent very interesting themes, and it's overall a pretty smartly executed satire that is also one of the few shows that dare to offer some social and political commentary without feeling the need to talk down to the audience and treat them like morons. Homelander very easily places himself in the top 5 greatest TV villains of all time, no I will not be taking questions at this time, and I also think that The Boys is pretty much one of the greatest examples of an adaptation that is way better than the source material, because I do not like the comic series this show is based on, but the show is pretty fucking good. However, I gotta admit, when Amazon announced a spin-off series of The Boys that would follow young adults in what is basically an X-Men school for messed up superheroes, I was very skeptical. I didn't know how I felt about the idea of a teen drama set in this universe, and I got nervous that this would be a greedy effort to build yet another connected cinematic universe we don't need, which could result in a misstep that would fail at expanding on a show I love so much. Long story short, it was a very, very, very risky move, and I gotta admit, I wasn't too excited about this spin-off, and I was very doubtful of the outcome. Thankfully, I was wrong. Gen V is one of the biggest surprises of the year for me. I did not expect this show to be this good. And you know what, given the track record of the original series, it shouldn't be surprising, but hey, at least I'm glad I was wrong. Let's just pretend that counts for something. I had a lot of fun watching this show, and I think having such low expectations made it even better for me. I had only watched the first teaser like in passing, so I didn't really know what the story of the show was gonna be. I had very little information about it. It, but from the very first episode, I was locked in, and I'm very excited to talk about it, especially because Gen V has some serious implications relating to the next season of The Boys, and that's something I was not expecting. Anyways, we're gonna talk about all that, but before we do, it's the perfect occasion to talk about The Boys Universe, because this video is sponsored by Opera GX, and you're gonna want to hear this. Thank you to Opera GX for sponsoring this video. Have you ever opened your browser and thought, man, this is really bland. It's like chicken with no seasoning. Well, you're not the only one. Turns out, a lot of people have developed a desire to personalize their browser's appearance. You know, shake things up a little, make it more interesting. Enter Opera GX, the absolute elite of browser customization. This browser offers an army of possibilities to customize your internet experience with GX Mods, which essentially gives you free range to 180 flip your entire browser with one click and change pretty much anything you want. Guys, literally, like, it's so versatile, it's insane. You can either choose from a massive collection of pre-designed mods, or you can create your own. And to give you the perfect example, if you're a fan of The Boys and Gen V, well, well, you are quite in luck, because Opera GX has partnered with the Boys franchise to create V, Vought International's social media site dedicated to the world of the Boys, built with an incredibly accurate simulation of how the characters of the shows would use this platform based on the plot so you can follow your favorite soups and access new content exclusively available to Opera GX users. It's right here in the sidebar. Oh, and if that wasn't enough, you can also put any other social media platform here too in this little sidebar, because obviously, broski, they know what they're doing. This is the real deal. Honestly, exploring all the possibilities to customize your browser is so much fun. There are so many options to choose from. It's honestly a delight. So if you also want to be cool and not like chicken with no seasoning, use my link in the description below to download Opera GX today. You'll be able to elevate your internet experience and completely remix your browser to the universe of the boys and Gen V. And if you haven't seen those shows by the way, especially Gen V because it just came out, it is available right now on Prime Video, so go watch it and you'll understand why this is so rad. So again, use my link in the description below to download Opera GX today. Thank you so much to Opera GX for sponsoring this video. You guys are the best and let's get back 
to the show. So Gen V is the story of Marie Moreau, a young woman who became an orphan as a child the day she discovered she had superpowers and accidentally murdered her own parents in her confusion. She was only 10 years old and the murder was witnessed by her little sister who was then adopted by a family and has refused to see Marie ever since. Eight years later, Marie lives in an institute for orphan soups and has become an exemplary student who dreams to become the first black woman to join the Seven, the legendary League of Superheroes led by Homelander. And her hard work pays off because when the show begins, Marie finds out she has been accepted to join the prestigious Godolkin University, more commonly known as God U, a school for superpowered young adults who aspire to become great superheroes. Sorry. When she arrives, Marie quickly finds out that God U is a very competitive school where students will do anything to gain popularity in the eyes of the public in order to be more valuable in the eyes of the establishment and rank in their highly coveted top 10 that guarantees them a high profile future. The current frontman of the school is a beloved young hero known as Golden Boy, who seems to just be the perfect man with stand up values. Marie tries to figure out a way to find her place in God U without compromising her values, but things take an insanely dark turn when a particular incident leads her to see something she was not supposed to see. And before she knows it, Marie and a group of elite students at God U find themselves uncovering a sinister conspiracy inside of the school that may lead to a cataclysmic event. And this premise right there is why I think Gen V works so well. It's why I enjoyed it so much. Because while it keeps the quote-unquote DNA of the boys, it also manages to have its own identity. And it creates its own identity by making the story a big mystery. Now, if you're familiar with my channel, which if you're not, what the hell, subscribe! You know that I am a sucker for well-crafted mysteries. And honestly, I think this show pulls it off. It could have been really easy for Gen V to just be the boys, but with teenagers. But that's not what it is. At its core, Gen V is a mystery with characters who have not fully been exposed to the realities of the world we've come to know in The Boys, which I think was a fantastic idea. Watching the characters slowly unravel pieces of the puzzle as they come to understand the entire conspiracy around God U is super compelling. Oh, and that is a big part of the show, by the way. Gen V would not work without its characters. I think he has a girlfriend, right? Yes, and she's hot. Oh my God. You're gonna have a three-way, you're literally living my dream. The characters of Gen V are really cool, and for the most part, all very interesting. They may not be as unique and charismatic as major characters in The Boys, like a Billy Butcher, a Homelander, a Stormfront, or a Frenchie, just to name a few, but I still found most of them to be engaging with their individual personalities and the core themes attached to their arcs. All of them are very well handled for the most part, and getting to know them is really fun, especially as they get to know a world that we, the audience, are already much more familiar with than they are. And that is most apparent with the main character, Marie Moreau, played by Jazz Sinclair, a face that should be familiar to a number of people. I've talked about Jazz Sinclair before because she played one of the main characters in Netflix's Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, which I made a video about a little while ago. And if you've seen that video, you know that I did not like her character in that show. I was not a fan of Roz and I was not a fan of Jazz's performance as this character. So I admit admittedly felt a little apprehensive knowing she would be playing the main character of Gen V, but I'm very happy to report that I was very wrong to be. Yeah, she shut me up real quick. Jess Sinclair is really good in Gen V. I loved her in it, and I loved her character. Marie is a very effective protagonist, and a quite interesting choice as the potential hero because of the nature of her powers. If you don't know, Marie is essentially a bloodbender. She can control blood in pretty much any way her mind can imagine, and when you meet her, she carries a knife around with her so she can cut her hands and use her own blood blood as a weapon. It's a very unconventional power for a protagonist, even for the universe of the boys. Even within the context of the story, Marie is looked at by other soups as a bit of a freak. They think her power is repulsive and obviously too violent for her to be perceived as a superhero. And the thing is, 
people are not necessarily wrong. Calling Murray's power horrific is kind of an understatement. Like I said earlier, she discovered her powers as a child, more specifically, the day she had her first period. And in her confusion and in her panic, she accidentally killed both her parents. She hasn't been in contact with her little sister since that happened, and today, Marie wants above anything else to be the best person she can possibly be and become a revered, super famous superhero so that she can prove to her little sister that she's not a monster. But as the show goes, you also get the sense that Marie is just as much trying to convince herself that she's not a monster. It's kind of why she's so determined. If she can prove to her sister that she's not this horrible monster, if her sister is able to forgive her, then she can forgive herself. And when the show begins, Marie is so focused on that long-term goal that she pushes people away before having a chance to get close to them. She's not interested in making friends, she's not interested in romantic relationships, she's not interested in anything aside from becoming the next superhero to join the Seven. And where I think that's really impactful is with the notion that Marie is a character that has only known this world of superheroes through the lens of the general public. Like, for what it is, you could say her biggest character flaw is that she's incredibly naive. She thinks superheroes are just like Superman, a beacon of hope and a great representation of good. She doesn't yet understand all of the insanity and ugliness of that world, and she's about to be hit hard with the reality that superheroes are not good people. And she's about to understand that becoming a superhero is not about virtue, determination, and the desire to help people, but it's all about appearances, vanity, politics, and money. As I mentioned, Marie tries to figure out a way to find her place in God U without compromising her values, but one night, she succumbs to peer pressure because she's a teenager, and she agrees to go out after curfew with the students in the school's top 10 ranking, including Golden Boy. But an incident at the bar they go to leads to one of the top students accidentally hurting someone and almost killing them, and the principal of God U, Mr. Brink, decides to kick Marie out of the school so she can take the fall for the other, more important kids who manage to leave the scene without being noticed, leaving the victim for dead. This is her first exposure to how corrupt the superhero world is. Marie thought she did the right thing by staying behind and saving the life of the poor human, which got her some well-deserved attention on social media, but because she was the only student seen at the bar, and because she's new and not valuable to the school, and because her superpowers are not marketable enough to make her a front-page hero, she immediately finds herself on the chopping block and is set up to take all the blame. And so, just like that, Marie's future ends as quickly as it started. Or maybe not. Because as she is about to leave the school, the plot completely shifts when Marie accidentally witnesses Golden Boy murdering Mr. Brink in his office. Which is the event that kickstarts the mystery of the show. And I gotta say, watching Marie being slammed in the face with the reality of the world she spent her entire life trying to be a part of is brutal. And as an audience member, it feels very different from the way you experience the revelation of that reality in The Boys, because in The Boys, you discover that reality along with Huey. But this time, you already know. This time, you're not discovering, you're waiting for the inevitable, because you already know the truth. So after the rose-tainted glasses are shattered, Marie finds herself in the middle of a huge mystery and a huge conspiracy, and she has to team up with other students of God U to get to the bottom of it. Emma is her eccentric roommate who really wants to be one of the cool kids, but has a superpower that makes her more of a joke among her peers, and so she leans more into her role as a punchline to get popularity because nobody really takes her seriously. And that's because Emma's superpower is shrinking. She's basically Ant-Man, or the Wasp. She can get really, really, really small, which got her the superhero name Little Cricket. However, the show kind of puts a twist on her power that makes her character kind of tragic. See, Emma's big secret is that in order to get small, she has to throw up. And once she's small, she can only get back to her normal size by eating food. And as you're probably guessing, yes, her superpower is pretty much a profoundly fucked up allegory for eating 
eating disorders, and she spends most of the show trying to convince the people around her that she's in control. And throughout the episodes, it takes an even darker dimension when you get to meet her mother, who very deliberately perpetuates that disorder. You need to be careful about your calorie intake, okay? Are you keeping your food log? Yes, mom, I am completely balanced. You look an inch or two shorter than usual, so you might need to add 50 calories. Oh, that scene made my blood boil. Emma, contrary to all of her peers, is actually really embarrassed by her superpower, but it's also the one thing that allows her to get the attention and validation she desperately craves. The way the show creates a parallel between her superpower and her insecurities and body image issues is super interesting, and Lizzie Broadway really carries this role with a lot of charisma. Emma grew on me as the show went. I didn't particularly like her at the very beginning, but I feel like this character very much finds her footing later in the story, and the themes around her character really make you feel for her. I, I don't know if I can if I can be like this. Andre is one of the top 10 students of God You, and he's also Golden Boy's best friend. His superpower is way more of a classic. He's just Magneto. He can control metal and do all sorts of shit with it, but you do find out something about his powers towards the end of the season, which I'm not going to spoil now. I really like Andre. I think he's a really cool character, and I think the primary reason why I like him so much is because Andre is played by Chance Perdomo, a very underrated and super talented actor who, by the way, was also in Chilling Adventures of Sabrina and was easily the best part of that entire show. He played Ambrose Spellman, Sabrina's cousin, who by himself carried about 80% of the show's charisma on his back. He was way too good for this show. His character here is way more low-key, like don't expect him to be like Ambrose. Andre is kind of a chill guy who doesn't really have his shit figured out. We learn that his father used to be a popular superhero who is now retired, and he's essentially Andre's coach slash manager now. He's incredibly strict and pushy with Andre because he wants him to become a popular superhero as well, and Andre works really hard to achieve that, but you get the sense that he's doing it more to please his dad than for himself. He doesn't seem to enjoy the never-ending popularity contest of God You at all, but he just kind of goes along with it because he doesn't really know anything else. The inner conflict that emerges in his character as he starts to uncover and understand the massive implications of the school's secrets is really compelling, and his storyline kind of takes a turn I didn't really expect, especially when his own secrets begin to emerge. Like I said, Andre is a really good character and Chance Perdomo effortlessly portrays him. I'm very excited to see where his story goes. Jordan is another one of God U's top 10 students and is a particular favorite of Mr. Brinks. And unlike other characters, Jordan stands out for having more than one superpower. They have super strength, like most soups, as well as the ability to blast people with some form of shining force field. But they're mostly famous for their physical power, which is the ability to to switch genders at will. They have a male incarnation and a female incarnation, meaning the character of Jordan is played by two different actors, London Thor and Derek Liu, who both do a great job in the role, although I think London Thor nails the character more and gives them a much stronger personality. And as you would guess, Jordan's gender switching ability is an allegory for non-binary identity. The big theme around that for them is feeling like they're not ever fully accepted. Jordan's life causes them a lot of insecurities due to people never fully accepting them. Their love life is uncomfortable because their partners will ask them to only appear in one form, whether it be as a man or as a woman, and people don't seem to understand understand that they are both. Both incarnations of Jordan are who they are. Appearing as both is their identity. We get a very uncomfortable episode where we're shown that their parents do not like to see them in girl form because they were born biologically male, and their dad seems to perceive Jordan's feminine form as a sort of rebellion. You can be a boy forever if you want. Sometimes I think you change into a girl just to spite me. Stop. There's also a smaller theme of internalized misogyny coming with that power, notably in one scene where Marie tells Jordan that they need to stop appearing as a man when they want to be taken seriously. It's kind of mentioned in passing, but it says a lot about the character. But overall, Jordan is a character that very much lives in their own head, and the feeling of never fully being accepted leads them to isolate in ways that can make them a bit selfish. The theme of them putting their wants and needs above anything else to the point of clouding 
finding their moral compass comes back at several points in the show, and it makes Jordan a fascinating character to explore. I killed my grandpa with my powers. No, you didn't. Yeah, I know, I was just feeling left out. Kate is a super popular student of the school, a close friend of Andre's, and she's also Golden Boy's girlfriend. She has the very particular power to control people's thoughts. Kate can make people feel, think, or do whatever she desires by touching them. Reservation under. We don't have one. But you don't give a fuck. Right? I do not give a fuck. However, her power functions only by skin-to-skin -skin contact, so she often wears gloves to make people around her more comfortable. There's general trust issues with a power like that. But the big thing with Kate is that her power also has a limit. If she uses it too much in a short period of time, it affects her own brain and she starts bleeding from her eyes and from her nose the closer she gets to having an aneurysm. If I'm being honest, Kate is probably my least favorite character of the ensemble. I do think the character's story is interesting and goes places I didn't really expect, but I didn't find the character herself that compelling and certainly certain ways that her story moves through the episodes was a little bit jarring to me, but we'll come back to that later. She's played by Maddie Phillips from Teenage Bounty Hunters, and she's fine. She's she's okay in the role. The ideas around Kate and her powers are not explored as much as the rest of the cast, but a lot of the core themes attached to her superpower are related to the subject of consent and it does play a big role in the story, especially in its second half. So yeah, basically Kate is an okay character that has her moments, that's about it. And then we have Luke, the unofficial sixth protagonist. Luke is the superstar of God You, and the world knows him as Golden Boy. And fun fact, he is played by Arnold Schwarzenegger's son. And he's pretty good in the role. Luke is kind of the most important character in this show, which is interesting because he's not in it very much. But yeah, uh, most of the mystery of the show is directly tied to him. When you meet him, he's the ultimate popular guy of the school. He's the top one student. There are talks about him joining the Seven. He's known all around the world. And he's just genuinely a great guy. And I think that was a very smart move by the writers because they know how to use the storytelling of the boy boys to trick you. See, The Boys teaches the audience to never trust a superhero. In this universe, if a character seems like too good of a person, they're probably full of shit, it's probably a facade, and they're probably fucking evil. And Luke is that good boy persona to a T. I mean, guys, his superhero name is literally Golden Boy. Like, it, it couldn't be more on the nose. He's a cool dude, he's popular, he has a cool best friend and a cool girlfriend, and everybody fucking likes him, and he just seems to be the friendliest guy on earth and his name is golden boy so if you've seen the boys the second you meet him you don't trust him you're like no nope, he's too good he's too perfect fuck that they set up luke to be such a perfect goody two-shoes nice boy that you're just conditioned to believe he's gonna turn out to be a secret psycho killer like homelander but no he dies in episode one and kicks off the mystery of the show but it turns out that he really was a good guy basically luke keeps having weird dreams of his his dead little brother Sam calling to him from a place he calls the woods. The dreams are insanely vivid to him, more like hallucinations, and they're becoming so intense that he's losing his grip on reality. He starts to believe that Brink is hiding something from him, and then he's hit with a reality that, in this first episode, we do not know yet. In a sort of complete trance of rage and confusion, he snaps and decides to kill Brink with his superpower. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, uh, Luke is basically the human torch. He can light himself and everything around him on fire. So he decides to kill Brink by burning him alive in his office and make it look like it was an accident caused by a mishandled candle. But his plan is fucked because Marie shows up to Brink's office at the same time and sees him kill killing Brink. Fortunately though, Marie realizes that if Brink is dead, it means nobody knows she was just expelled from God You and she can stay. So she tells Luke she didn't see anything and is not gonna tell a soul. But Luke starts to freak out because his plan is compromised. So still seeming a little unstable, he decides that he has to kill Marie too 
because she's the only witness. He's clearly in the middle of some kind of emotional meltdown and he starts chasing Marie around campus. Thankfully, they run into Jordan Lee who tries to calm Luke down, but it doesn't work and a fight breaks out in the school all the way to the front door. Eventually, Andre sees what's happening, he intervenes and he manages to calm Luke down. Luke seems completely distraught and emotional, he seems completely disoriented, he apologizes and then he flies up into the sky and he kills himself. This event kickstarts the whole mystery of the season and that mystery is really neat. The conspiracy around God Yu and this mysterious place called the woods is really fucking captivating and the different twists that come through the show are all incredibly well executed. A couple of them had my jaw on the floor because I genuinely did not see them coming and yet there were a lot of very clever clues carefully sprinkled throughout the season. All of the characters have their part to play in the mystery but in ways you wouldn't necessarily expect. They all have their secrets and their motivations and the implications of the mystery answers all hold a lot of weight, not only for the future of the show, but also for the future of the boys. And the way Gen V ties into the events of the boys is also really interesting. I believe this show takes place right after the events of season 3, there are little references here and there. And also, fun fact, the character of Marie Moreau was teased in season 3 of the boys. You can see her briefly appear on a screen when Huey is investigating the Red River Institute, the orphanage where Marie lives at the beginning of Gen V. And yes, Gen V very much serves as an important stepping stone for The Boys Season 4, especially when it comes to the woods. So if you haven't seen the show, get out now, go watch it, and then come back. This is your warning, I'm about to spoil the fuck out of this show. This is a threat, leave now! So, it turns out that Godolkin University has a secret underground prison slash laboratory where Vought, the evil mega corporation that runs the top superhero business, is capturing and experimenting on young soups with powerful abilities. And this underground facility, you guessed it, is the woods. Marie and her new friends come to learn that Golden Boy's little brother Sam is actually not dead at all, but he's being kept in the woods as Vought experiments on him to make him stronger. In episode 1, Marie and Andre have to briefly team up to help security stop an unstable student who tried to run away from the school in the middle of the night, and they realize much later on that this kid was Sam. And that's when they solve a piece of the puzzle. Luke killed Mr. Brink after he realized Sam was was still alive in the woods and he realized that the school is a front to hide the secret lab. Just like it's said by another character later on, the students of God Yu are not here to study, they're here to be studied. That information is later confirmed verbatim by the school's dean, Miss Shetty. More on her later. Luke had also been experimented on, but his memory was tempered with and he didn't remember any of it, nor did he remember his own brother. The weird dreams he had where his brother talked to him were actually his memories he's trying to break through. That's why he was so mentally unstable and disoriented at the end of season 1. His memory had been tempered with so much that it kind of fractured his mind. But Luke was a good guy. He was trying to destroy the woods and free his brother. Marie, I... I had to. I didn't see anything. You don't understand what Brink did, okay? You don't know about the woods. But the other big twist that is directly linked to Luke is how his memory was erased. Early in the show, we meet a student named Rufus that has the power to mess with people's memories. We even see that he uses this power to sexually assault women. Like, he's an absolute piece of shit. And so Marie and the gang immediately figure out that this Rufus guy might have been easily corrupted by the Dean to erase Luke's memories every time he was released from the woods. And they immediately go after him. Except they're wrong. It was a misdirect. Rufus didn't actually do anything to Luke and the reveal is that Luke's memories were actually erased by Kate his own girlfriend. Yeah, it turns out that Kate was secretly working for the Dean this entire time. We find out that Miss Shetty has essentially manipulated Kate her entire life and Kate developed a blind loyalty to her because she's the only mother figure she's had since childhood. She's known about the woods from the start and she even helped them experiment on Luke and Sam. And yes, she's the one who repeatedly wiped Luke's memory by using her power of compulsion to cloud his mind. Okay. Forget, forget, forget. 
But Marie and the gang don't know that yet. They think Kate is with them, and Kate is acting as the perfect little spy for Miss Shetty to know what Marie is up to at all times. So now that they know Sam is still alive, Andre and Emma team up to get him out of the woods, and they succeed in doing so, but while Sam is a good, innocent boy, he is also very unstable, which is a problem because after all of the experiments that were done on him, he's just too strong and too dangerous. He's basically the Homelander of the show, like nobody can really take him in a fight, which is a problem because he's often subject to sudden fits of rage that make him kill people. There's a whole incident that leads the gang to have to fight him to stop him from killing someone, and in one of my favorite moments of the season, in the middle of the action, the scene suddenly cuts and the characters wake up at a party days later with no memory of what happened since the beginning of the season. It's fucking Saturday. Hold up. It is fucking Saturday. Guys, there are days that I am missing. It's such an inventive and frankly terrifying display of how insane it is that soups can just erase your memory. They discover later on that Kate is the one who made them forget, which leads to a fight that locks the gang inside of Kate's mind. Jensen Ackles gets a hilariously uncomfortable cameo as a version of Soldier Boy in Kate's mind that is sort of a weird incarnation of her libido. Some of the lines Jensen had to blurt out of his mouth Mouth are so out of pocket, I honestly have no idea how he managed to keep a straight face. She'd crank up the Jonas Brothers. She'd hump a soldier boy pillow. She'd raw dog that pillow till she saw God. Gross. It was pretty romantic. However, while all of that is being dealt with, there is a looming question mark hovering over the entire mystery. And that question mark is the goal of the woods. Why did Vaught create a fake university to hide a secret underground lab? Why are they experimenting on these young soups? Like, what are they trying to accomplish here? Well, enter Indira Shetty the ruthless dean of God You. Miss Shetty is the one running the woods and reporting back to Vaughn. She's a very important character and through her scenes we get some of the biggest answers around this entire conspiracy. It's revealed that Vaughn created the woods to allow a genius scientist to craft and test a special virus that can make super-powered beings compliant. Or in other words, Vought is trying to find a way to enslave soups. But the big twist is that Indira Shetty is not really on Vought's side. She actually has an agenda of her own. The entire time she's been in the position, she's been influencing the development of that virus behind Vought and Brink's back. Why? Because Shetty is actually trying to develop a virus that can kill soups, not control them. Her ultimate goal is to create a highly contagious airborne virus that only affects soups and kills them in a short period of time. She then plans to release that virus into the world and exterminate superpowered people. She wants to wipe them all out. All of them. The reason why she's doing all of this is because, as we find out towards the end of the season, Indira had a husband and a child who both died in a plane crash. More specifically, in a plane crash that happens in season one of The Boys. Yes, it's the plane that Homelander deliberately refused to save and let crash in that famous scene from episode four. Come on! No, man, no, you stay back! All of you, stay back! You stay the fuck back or I'll laser you, goddammit! I'll laser every fucking one of you! Shetty is consumed by grief and a desire for revenge that is directed not only at Homelander, but at all soups. She is tired of seeing the never-ending trail of violence caused by soups and she wants to put an end to it. And she succeeds? Sort of. Miss Shetty actually manages to force the head scientist of the woods to make the virus lethal. It's tested on a couple of captured students, and once she's got confirmation that it works, she tells the doctor to now make the virus airborne, so that its contagion can be exponentially increased. Her plan was basically perfect, except for one little mistake. Her mistake was to trust Kate with her plan. To be fair though, she only ends up telling her when her back is basically against the wall, but Kate ends up turning against her and forcing her to confess her plan to the gang. Tell them what you told me. Thomas Godolkin was a behavioral scientist. He built this place to figure out what makes soups tick. 
You're not here to study. The school is here to study you. Kate disagrees with this plan. She aligns more with the idea of a soup supremacy. So she uses her superpower to make Miss Shetty kill herself. And then she takes Sam with her and heads to the university where she plans to free all of the kids in prison in the woods to lead them in a mutiny to kill every single human on campus. And that is where we head to the finale. Now that all the secrets of the show are revealed, I gotta say, I fucking love that mystery. I think they knocked it out of the park. It's really well crafted. There are a number of moving parts in it, but they all come together in a way that's very satisfying. I have a couple of issues with it that I'll get back to later, but globally speaking, it just works. And one of the elements that make it work so well is the way it is entirely driven by the characters. See, the big difference in themes between the boys and Gen V is how characters perceive their actions. Gen V really explores how different people view the notion of being a hero and how they interpret what that means. In The Boys, almost every character just kind of does what's best for them. Most of the characters' motivations are selfish, and they know it. That's kind of the whole point of the show. However, characters in Gen V all really believe they're doing the right thing. They all think what they're doing is what it means to be a hero, which makes sense because that's all they want to be. That's why they're at God U. And all of it comes to a head in the final episode. The season finale is basically a very long battle. Kate and Sam free the rest of the prisoners in the woods and they are unleashed on the school to exact their revenge and it's essentially an all-out war at God U. Marie and the gang show up and they try to stop them, but there's too much chaos and way too many of the others, and they're struggling to keep up. Sam feels sort of conflicted about the carnage, but he also believes humans will only ever hurt him, so to cope with his emotional turmoil, he decides to let Kate use her powers on him to erase his emotions, which essentially turns him into a Terminator. During the battle, Marie finally starts to understand that she has never had a chance to unlock her full power, and as the episode goes, you watch her as she slowly understands just how many ways she can use her bloodbending, which is a really nice parallel to her meeting with Victoria Newman, the mysterious character from The Boys who makes people's heads explode, where it is revealed that Marie has the exact same power as her. Yes, it turns out that Victoria is also a bloodbender which we didn't know. But she mainly uses her power to blow people's heads off. That's like her signature move. And this comes back in the finale when Marie unlocks this exact same ability in a moment of panic and blows up Kate's left arm to prevent her from touching Jordan. It's a very interesting turn of events that signals just how insanely powerful Marie is going to become when she fully comes to grab the extent of her abilities. But the big moment of the season finale comes right after that. It is absolute mayhem on Kate campus, yada yada yada, but what the characters didn't know this entire time is that Ashley Barrett, the CEO of Vought, is currently inside of the school. And if you've seen season 3 of The Boys, you know that Ashley has become the right-hand woman of Homelander. And so, she asks for a call to be made, and Homelander himself arrives at God U. I'm sorry, but that detail of him having a more classic superhero theme that keeps playing out of tune is so fucking funny. Whoever had this idea is a fucking genius, give them a raise. Marie tries to explain to Homelander what happened, but he cuts her off immediately and berates her for attacking her own kind. Sir, I am... What kind of animal are you? Now, a lot of people were bothered by that line because they say it doesn't make sense for Homelander to say this knowing that he attacks and kills soups all the time, but I actually think this is very on brand for him. Like, yeah guys, Homelander is a hypocrite. This isn't news. Like, it makes sense that he would allow himself to do it while finding it unacceptable in others, all while publicly preaching that notion for whatever news outlet will cover his words, just so that he can keep this image of the soup supremacist that he started to build. And it's also a theme that has become more and more present with Homelander, especially in season three. Vicky, I'm glad you chose your own kind. That was smart. 
If you ask me, I think the line was less a representation of what he did before and more of a teaser of what he's gonna turn into in season 4. Anyways, Homelander lasers the fuck out of Marie and he, along with Vaught, decides to spin the narrative of the entire incident in the media to paint Marie, Andre, Jordan, and Emma as the dangerous criminals who caused all the violence at God U while making Kate and Sam the heroes who fought to defend it. We see Homelander smiling at his TV watching the news, overjoyed by the amount of control he now has, and then the season ends with Marie waking up with her gang in a hospital room with no windows and no doors with no idea of where they are. It's a really solid conclusion that does a fantastic job at making you want to see what happens with these characters in season 2, while also building a real hype for the next season of The Boys. I've seen a bunch of people online saying that the season finale of Gen V kind of makes the show a kind of season 3.5 of The Boys rather than its own show, and I guess that's not entirely false, but I also think it works. Because the finale suggests that Homelander might be starting his own little army of radicalized soups by taking under his wing young and impressionable soups like Kate and Sam that look up to him and also think that, you know, humans are inferior to soups. I could see him creating his own version of the Seven who are all maneuvering for a superpower supremacy with humans at the bottom. And the thing is that Sam, the overpowered kid with an unstable psyche, has not only been influenced by other kids to follow into an extremist view of humans being inferior to soups, but he also had his feelings removed by Kate. So like, he's basically an unstoppable killing machine that could serve Homelander in the long run. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, the season closes with a post credit scene which acts as the confirmation that Butcher knows about the existence of the virus. So yeah, the ending is actually a very poignant setup for season 4 of The Boys, especially because it has recently been confirmed that this next season will be taking place just about a month after after the events of Gen V. Eric Kripke, the showrunner of The Boys and producer of Gen V, said that he knew he wanted the virus to be a big part of season 4, and if you ask me, I think this was an excellent way to introduce it. Because just like that, I think you'll probably be able to watch season 4 of The Boys without having seen Gen V, but I think if you've seen Gen V, you're gonna get a bunch of extra context that's probably gonna make it more satisfying to watch. Overall, I think Gen V is an absolute win. Is it as good as The Boys? No, it's not. I know that some people get really weird with spin-offs where like if it's not as good or better than the original series it means it's garbage, but no. It's still an extremely solid entry into the universe that managed to do its own thing while taking the global story of the boys a step forward. It's fun, it's charismatic, it's clever, and it surpassed all of my personal expectations. Now, I kind of alluded to it, but the show is not perfect. I do have my issues with Gen V, don't get me wrong. There are some things here and there that I didn't particularly like. For one, I think that Sam's radicalization as a superhero supremacist is very abrupt and happens way too quickly. I guess that it sort of makes sense because he's so incredibly unstable mentally and he's sort of like a child who can be influenced very easily and I guess he needed a target to direct his anger at. But the fact that he spends like a couple of hours with people who believe humans are inferior and that it becomes his entire character moving forward was a bit of a stretch. Secondly, while I love the themes attached to each of the main characters, I would say that by the end of the season, their arcs don't feel as complete as you would expect. I did like that Marie lets go of her desire to be a hero and decides she just wants to do what she can to be a good person because she realizes you don't need one to be the other. But other characters like Jordan Lee, Andre, Emma, and even Kate kind of get the short end of the stick when it comes to their arcs. And speaking of Kate, her complete moral 180 made for a fun twist but was a little jarring? Like from what we had seen up until the finale, Kate was deeply loyal to Indira but also very much loved her friends. More specifically Andre who we found out she had an affair with when Luke was still alive and having that sudden switch where she kills Indira and votes to off all humans on campus while fully gunning for her friends to be killed, Andre included, came a little bit out of nowhere for me. I guess it needed to happen for the finale to take place because Sam would not have had the initiative to do that 
on his own. And I guess you could say that that's Kate's way of like gaining control back and not having people telling her what to do, which kind of would make sense for her sort of, but it still felt like a very abrupt change in the character. And lastly, I think the one issue I had a hard time ignoring when watching was simply the chemistry between the characters. It's not awful, some of them have good chemistry, but it's also not the best. Like, by the end of the show, the gang still doesn't quite feel like friends. At least, not all of them. I think this is gonna get better in the future, but for now, yeah. The lack of chemistry between certain characters was a little distracting to me. There's also like three romantic storylines in this show. You got Andre and Kate, Emma and Sam, and Jordan and Marie none of them are really good. Andre and Kate just don't have the impact I think they were supposed to have. Emma and Sam are just weird because Sam has the personality of like a seven-year-old boy. Like they have sex, but Emma also babysits him like he's a child. Do not answer the door no matter what. Okay. Stranger danger. Stranger danger. Stranger danger. Sam, Sam, we gotta hide you. It's okay. We just gotta hide you. Man. Oh, Oh my yeah. guys. No. I think I saw God. Yo, you're sick to my stomach. Fam. A lot of what their relationship is is basically a one for one description of pop culture detectives born sexy yesterday trope, except the genders are reversed. Jordan and Murray is probably the best pair out of the three, but I don't think it would be crazy to say this relationship needed a bit more time to be developed. I do like them together, I think they're a good fit, and it might be a better storyline to follow in season two when things are already more established, but for now, yeah, the relationships in this show are not the strongest. But that's kind of all I can think about in terms of complaints, and most of them are nitpicks. Again, making this spin-off was taking a huge risk. It was a massive gamble because this is a universe you do not want to fuck up. But they really did pull it off. It might not be perfect, but Gen V is a blast. And like I said, I was really on the fence about it before it came out, but I was pleasantly surprised at almost every turn. The mystery of the season is captivating, the way it expands the lore is really fun, the characters are really cool, and I cannot wait to see where their story goes in season two. I have no idea if any of these characters will be part of the next season of The Boys. Um, I have a feeling that the idea behind having them locked up in the finale is to justify them not being in the season, but either way, whatever they have in store for us in the future, I am all in. But if you know, you know.